Have you heard the new theory going around that, that Kurt Cobain was transgendered? <laughs> uh, yeah, transgender. Gosh, really? Uh, no, I hadn't Apparently. heard that. I hadn't heard that one. No. It, this, it's it, this is because he's a feminist and he liked to wear dresses. Apparently, it oh. means he was a transgender. Well, so was David I think Bowie. He just had well, well, I, I wouldn't be surprised if David Bowie was even human. But you know, that, oh, that's, <laughs> but yeah, transgender, that would be maybe. that would be so awesome if he was like sent, you know, because he did yeah. have that he did have that aspect to him, didn't he? Bowie was well, he, Bowie, he, Bowie was amazing. He, I didn't always like his music, but what an amazing guy. What's well, it? That's exactly how I feel about him. I I, I dis dislike about eighty percent of his catalog, but I, I think he's one of the most <laughs> yeah one of the most important musicians to ever walk the earth. You know, like he's yeah um, he was I, great I, because I, because he he did he he was an example to all of us. I think I, this is bizarre. We started off with Kurt Cobain, this transgender, and now we're on to Bowie immediately. <laughs> sort of, we just immediately retreat to our comfort zone, but we don't want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but Bow Bowie was a fantastic exactly. example to, to all of us on how to grow old gracefully, you know, how to how to take it on the chin, the fact that you weren't as popular as you once were, but keep going, you know, and not moan about it. You know, not not be not 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 age disgracefully, you know. Just yeah. you know, we we've talked recently about, you know, Roger Waters and the Beatles and I think they're they're kind of aging disgracefully. They're like desperately trying to hold on to that thing that they had, you know, and they're all in their 80s now, and it's, oh, you know, we're still the Beatles, we're still Pink Floyd, you know? And Bowie just said, fuck it, you know, people don't buy my records, I'm still going to make them, I've got enough money to just keep making records and do my art and all that kind of stuff. And he was he was wonderfully self-effacing as well, and just every time you see him in an interview or, you know, in any kind of non-musical setting, he, he just comes across as being a guy that's that's very open and very together, and listens to the questions and answers them properly. You know, I I, I liked him, and I, I would I would have loved to have been in that that restaurant in Germany when David Bowie and Frank Zappa had a to do. That would have been. I mean, yeah. with, the Adrian Ballou tells the story. If if anybody's listened to this and wants to look it up, it's a great story. You know that uh, that uh, Bowie tried to steal uh, Frank's uh, protege. Because, because you know, he um, Adrian Ballou was Frank's protege at that point. Frank had spent an enormous amount of time on on Ballou, getting him up to speed. Because Ballou didn't read music, so he had to be coached. And Frank took yeah. him under his wing. And obviously, obviously, as far as Frank loved anybody, he loved Adrian Ballou. He thought he was brilliant. And then Bowie comes along and says, "I'll have him." <laughs> and apparently, Frank was very, very rude to David Bowie, called him the spaceman and all that kind of stuff. And made so I would have loved to be a fly in the wall for that one. That would have been. It might have destroyed my any any remaining respect I've got for Frank might have been destroyed in that moment, you know. But apparently Bowie took it in, took it in good humour, which is another another sort of uh, mark in his favour. I think you know he was just laughing about it all. Yep, I the w one thing about like my my one sour part with point with Bowie is I think um uh it, like the, is I I I think he got a lot of credit for being more of an innovator when he was more of a follower. Um, but not not to his discredit. Like I don't think he was like a, a copycat, but I think he he always had his ear and finger on the bleeding edge of of pop music and experimental music, and he was always blending those two things. Like he was always making a current pop record that also had current like socially acceptable experimentation happening, you know. And which I think personally that's brilliant. Like I mean, because no one else was really doing it like he was, and able to bring it to the mainstream like he was. So I think you know guys like Bowie made it okay for guys like you and me to make the music we make you know because you know like even like right back to the beginning like with that uh, major tom uh, space oddity song like that that song there sounds a lot like what was happening at the time but it also has something that not, nobody else was doing yet you know like it was it had its own thing and um so because of that i i i, I think bowie probably with zappa i think zappa probably saw that as a weakness you know as like oh you're just like Zappa saw himself as a pioneer, probably saw Bowie as a, as a coattail rider, you know. Yeah, um, well, I don't. I don't that, agree. There's that song. <laughs> um, uh, it's on. Does humor belong in music? Uh, what's it called? Be be in my video. That's about Bowie, and at least in okay. part, you know. Um, so if, you, if people listen to that, they'll get they'll get Frank's. Frank viewed pop music basically with disdain, you know, and I think he viewed Bowie with disdain because he was pop. And didn't give him any yeah. credit for being, you know, as you say, not on the cutting edge, but on the bleeding edge of 
I mean, but Bowie did. He did bring a lot to the to the table, you know. I mean, he was. Oh, yeah. He hung out in Berlin with the Berlin Krautrock people, you know, and nothing really came of that. There was there was never really any. I think Bowie kind of took the ideas and ran with them, but he didn't. There was no real sort of Bowie cluster collaboration that I know of, uh, and Brian Eno was there as well, wasn't he? So there was all that sort of stuff going on, but uh, it, it would have been so amazing if. If Bowie had found a way to include Cluster on one of his albums and done done something really, really radical, but that's what you're talking about. You're talking about he wasn't prepared to at that time anyway. He wasn't prepared to risk everything because he knew he had a lot. But by, by the time he arrived in Berlin, he had he had a lot, you know. And he writes about that on his last album, doesn't he? Um, he sure does. And that I think is his best album. I think Black Star is Bowie's best record. My from my perspective. I would agree, actually. It, it it really floored me when I heard it. It was <laughs> some parts of it are a bit a bit like the 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 filler stuff that Bowie always sort of put in his albums to my ear. The, the Bowie singles were for a, for a little while. Bowie singles were without parallel. You know, they they were they were amazing, and then you would get the album, and it was like, oh, that doesn't quite. That's not. It's not an album filled with singles. You know, it's, this is an album with two singles on it or one single on it. And Black Star was more consistent than that, I thought. But there were still moments where I thought, I don't get that. That's just, that's just filler to me. Um, it's difficult to explain, isn't it? Because a lot. I know a lot of people really love Bowie and love everything that he's done, and don't see that. You know, they they they, they might hear me say that and go, yeah, you're, you're talking crap because it's it's just to do with musical taste. But what I loved about Bowie was stuff like Gene Genie and Rebel Rebel and uh, uh, Life on Mars and that kind of era where he really it, it was he, he was part of a scene and I was I was only an early in my early teens at that point and he, he was part of a scene where you really didn't know what was coming next you know it was all new not just to me but to the world because it was the first time these things had been done so that was incredibly exciting and when you when you go back and look at the the, the sort of stuff that he did by the time he was very successful he was really I think you're right at that point he was he was a a, a dedicated follower of fashion to, to quote an old song you know he was he was he knew what the fashions were he probably knew what fashions were coming and he he adopted those you know the, the, then you get the thin white duke and all that kind of stuff and the 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 ashes to ashes Bowie and all these kind of things where yeah he was by that time a bit of a follower but in the early days his, his first well, in in the early 70s by the you know because he had that he had that initial career didn't he that that, that flopped uh, where he did that weird first album that that uh, everybody tries to forget and then he came back with a sort of heavy metal thing that the was that was that the man who sold the world I think was the the first sort of oh, the man the, yeah that might have been yeah I yeah. love that track yeah, the, well, the, the the album is 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 Bowie trying to be, yes, it's, it's essentially heavy metal in in it in its in the way it kind of sets things out. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, but I can, see why, I can see that now that you say that. Yeah, somebody said to for... me it was like Bowie trying to be Black Sabbath, and I I thought really, and I went and listened and I went, oh I can see that <laughs> okay, but exactly. it's Bowie's version of Black Sabbath. Uh, yeah, but by the time you get to Aladdin Sane and uh, that kind of stuff, you know, he's he's really. I, I I can remember it. I can remember the feeling of seeing that album cover, and really, really wanting that album to be the best album ever, and then being so disappointed because it wasn't an album filled with the stuff he put on his singles. That there was a lot of filler in it, and all of his albums like that. But I do have his greatest hits up there in my collection. You know, I've got the a double CD of of all the all the great stuff, and uh, yeah, got a lot of time for Bowie the person. Some time for some of his music, but. Uh, so Kurt Cobain's transgender, we're, we're, we're saying, are we? Maybe. <laughs> and I, I also want to, I, I was wanted to say, but before we before we like finish on the Bowie thing, I just wanted to say for anybody who's listening, who who's questioning my view on Bowie or whatever, um, just to say, you know, my favorite Bowie records, um, and, and then this is someone who's listened. I've listened to every Bowie record, you know. Um, is, is it goes low, and then it jumps all the way to Earthling in the '90s, right? And then and then Heathen. And then Black Star. Those are yeah. my favorite Bowie records. Yeah. And I know that Earthling and Heathen are probably off most people's Bowie radar. Yeah. They're going like, those aren't, they're probably like, that's that's not Bowie. That's not Bowie. But my, to me, that's Bowie. Like I, 
my introduction to David Bowie, my real, like, when I started falling in love with him was through Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails, right? And, and Nirvana, Kurt Cobain, right? He covered The Man Who Sold the World on uh, acoustic guitar on the Nirvana Unplugged record. And I th still think that's one of the greatest covers I've ever heard. So much so that I, I don't think it's Bowie's song anymore. It's Kurt Cobain's song. <laughs> I think right. The Man Who Sold the World is, is he stole it in 1994 and he never gave it back. Um, so, and, and that's fine. I mean, I, I, and I think a lot of people would agree that the Kurt Cobain version off that, that album, that unplugged version is superior to Bowie's version in some way. Now, not to say like cover songs are rarely superior, but sometimes like, like what's that one famous one that everybody would probably say is the best version of the song that, uh, um, I can't remember it now. That's a stupid lyric, but revving up like a deuce in the middle of the night or whatever, blinded by the light by uh, the man for man band. It was terrible. Yeah. But Man for Man made it an amazing song. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Now, Man Who Sold the World was already an amazing song. And somehow Kurt Cobain was able to sprinkle some magic on it that kind of reinvigorated it. And, um, and then and Bowie was also a, a mentor to Trent Reznor. Like Trent Reznor in the 90s was addicted to heroin. Uh, he was a drug addict. and many, Sorry, a, a drunk. Uh, he's on cocaine too. And, and Bowie, who can't point the finger at anybody, but any of that kind of stuff, was on tour with Trent. Or at least... I don't know if they were touring yet, but he saw him live and came backstage and told Trent Reznor that, like, look, you are probably the greatest thing to music since me, <laughs> you know? Nah. And, <laughs> and, and he kind of took Trent under the wing and said, like, look, you can't do this. You can't continue on this way. You're like, you're going to burn out. I, I can tell you right now, the Thin White Duke was not a happy part of my life, and you don't want to live that, you know? And, um, and, I, and I, think, I think we have Trent Reznor still because of David Bowie. Like, Trent Reznor was one of those guys we almost lost a couple of times mm. like Kurt Cobain. We, we did lose, you know, and you know, he's, it, he was almost a casualty of the, of the nineties resurgence of the heroin thing, you know, cause mm. for some reason, I don't, I don't know what it was about the nineties, but it seemed like heroin was cool again all of a sudden, you know, and probably because of the, the Seattle grunge guys, cause they were all doing heroin, mm. you know, like, like heavily and, and talking about it in interviews and they were rom romanticizing about it, you know, and I'm, and Bowie came in and basically picked his favorite guy and said, you can't be like these guys, you know, and, and, Trent Reznor is one of the only non-casualties of the 90s, uh, you know, pop music scene, you know? So I, th I think David Bowie's a bit of a hero in that regards, too. You know, and it, for him to be able to instill wisdom in his peers, you know, and not get ruff his feathers ruffled about the immaturity of it, right? Because it's got to be hard to be, you know, Bowie's 20, 30 years older than Trent Reznor, and to sit there in the back room with him and see all these young people being stupid and knowing better, like knowing that he knows better than them but it doesn't instead of turning his back he he hugs them and says look guys it can be better mm. you know so i also always be grateful because if it wasn't for david bowie i wouldn't have some of my favorite albums from yeah. trent reznor i think yeah I, th I think that that speaks well to bowie's character and that's the it doesn't that, i hadn't heard that story before but it doesn't surprise me you know that he would do that um because he was he was himself lost for a while and he managed to find find his way back and did did reznor go to uh, therapy or did, did he sort of just kick it himself? Do you know what the story is there? Um, well, I don't, you know, I, Trent Reznor only rarely gives in-depth interviews. I've only seen him give an interview maybe once or twice where he, he lets personal information in, right? So um, I don't truly know if Trent ever went to rehab or anything like that. Um, I know he took five years off of music. Like right. he didn't do any, he didn't do any touring and recording for almost five years there from like 1999 till 2005 or 2000 to 2005. Um, and in that period, he went from being like 140 pounds to like 200 pounds and just pure muscle. Like the, I went to see Trent Reznor in 1999 with perfect circle. And he looked like he was so frail. He could barely stand up. You know, like he was, he was and that's when he was at his worst. And then I saw him again, six years later and he looked like Sylvester Stallone on stage. <laughs> like, and I was like, Holy shit. Like what happened? You know? And he hasn't really talked about it much, but I heard an interview one time with Josh Holm from Queens of the Stone Age, mm. who's friends with Trent Reznor as well. Uh, and Dave, he was friends with David Bowie and Iggy Pop. Oh, man, wouldn't it be so cool to hang out with Trent Reznor, Iggy Pop, David Bowie, and Josh Holm? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think but, if you did, you would feel so inadequate, you'd never recover. I mean, that would be my view. I, I, I don't like to you're, meet my... You're probably right. I don't like to meet my heroes. Fly on the wall. Yeah, because fly on the right. wall. Yeah, definitely fly on the wall. Yeah, def, fly, fly <laughs> yeah. on the wall. But meeting them, trying to be like them? No, 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 no. So through, through Josh Holm, I heard an interview one time where the interviewer, Zane Lowe, the guy that does like Apple Music interviews and stuff, wonderful interviewer, um, he made some joke about, uh, about Trent Reznor being out of control, about like 
Like, what the hell is going on? Is he like lifting houses now? Like, why is he so big all of a sudden? <laughs> you know? And uh, Josh Holmes smiled and said, look, man, you know, he's getting his shit together. And Josh Holmes scratches his nose and goes, we all have an itch to scratch, you know? And uh, some of us have to do it. You know, we just got to, we got to figure out a way to get, scratch that itch. And I think what he's trying to say is like, look, he, it's either that or he's getting fucked up. He's either lifting weights or he's doing drugs. Yeah. He doesn't know how to do one or the other. And, and I think a lot of musicians, I've seen that where they clean themselves up. They focus on something else that's extreme to sort of take their, take their uh, focus away from the thing that was dragging them down. Yeah. yeah and that's, yeah. So that was the closest thing I got. So I think Josh Holm let out the fact that like maybe he was still had some problem with the nose candy or whatever else, the booger sugar, you know, and decided to, to turn to head lifting weights to, to cope with that. Yeah. You know, and so I don't know if there was therapy involved or if it was just uh, Trent Reznor is a smart enough guy to realize that I just got to change my focus. That's you just got to change your focus. That's all it's about, mm. you know, and, and I agree with that. You know, I'm the kind of person that is always going all the time. So I need to, you know, I love old adages, right? Old adages. The older I get, those adages keep coming more and more true. And one of my favorite ones is idle hands or the devil's play thing, right? And they so fucking are, man. For me, anyway. Like, if I don't focus on something positive, I'm going to do something stupid. You know? <laughs> just... so, you know. That's uh, that's very self-knowing of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it, and it was probably through my studying of my heroes, right, who have faltered and were able to pick themselves back up. You know, and I thought, well, I'm no different than Trent Reznor or David Bowie and these guys, right? I'm a very I'm a creative entity. You know, I'm a weirdo. And, uh, and I have an eccentric, you know, so I, I had the same proclivities and the same weaknesses they have and the same strengths in many ways. And I'm not, mm. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to say like I'm better than Dave Gilmore or Roger Waters or anything, <laughs> but <laughs> I am saying I had that in me and I know you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Like yeah, that, yeah. Of course. I, yeah. There, there's a reason you'd rather spend all night by yourself in a dimly lit room making music that no one's going to listen to. <laughs> yeah. 